there's an error in the bisection of the leg. There's an error in the goniometer itself. When you start adding up the errors, you're at 10, 12 degrees of error just in your measurement. And then you're applying from that measurement a correction of 4 degrees or 6 degrees. So you have 12 degrees of error, 4 degrees of correction. Do you see a problem with that? I do. It's, it's kind of, it moots the point. Then I was taught, as you were taught, to take the foot and hang it out in space and wrap plaster around it. The problem with this technique is that there is no frame of reference. When I was in engineering, when you wanted to make the same thing happen over and over again, first thing you did was you built a big steel frame. You bolted it to the ground. It's your frame of reference. Then you stamp it off the frame. That way you get the same thing happening over and over again. We have no frame of reference in our casting technique. Then what do we do? We're looking for a sub-tailor joint rotational position. So you'd think we would palpate the sub-tailor joint, but we don't. We palpate the talonavicular joint. Even if you fuse the talonavicular joint, there's still a small amount of motion available in the subtalar joint. That's why you do a triple arthrodesis. You have to fuse talonavicular, subtalar, and calcaneocuboid to stop the motion. So we're palpating the wrong joint while pushing up on the fourth and fifth. Pushing up on the fourth and fifth would be dorsiflexion eversion external rotation, which is open chain pronation. You're pre-pronating the foot. And I raise my hand in glass and go, you seem to be pronating the foot. And I go, no. According to Root, we're locking the mid-tarsal joint. And I'd say, no, you got your fingers on the mid-tarsal joint. <laughs> That's the one you're holding. You must be pronating the sub joint. And they'd say, do you want to pass this course, wise guy? And I'd say, we're not worthy. <laughs> well, how accurately can anybody cast? This article addresses that, January 2003, JATMA. Craig Payne in Australia took 10 brand new students at La Trobe University of Podiatry, 10 experienced doctors, and the one person that everyone agreed was the Leonardo da Vinci of casting. They all cast the same foot. Leonardo cast the same foot 10 times. All three groups had the same variation in forefoot to rear foot angulation. 10 to 12 degrees, with a total between groups of 16 and a half degrees. This is the major determinant of arch height. And yet, the variation was enormous. Add that to all the other errors that we just gave you. Now, I had Craig Payne visit me. He was the one that did the article. And while he was visiting me, I said, Craig, whose foot did you use? He said, mine. I said, let me see your foot. I grabbed his foot, and he has a rigid foot. <laughs> Imagine if they did this <laughs> test on someone with a decent range of motion in their forefoot. And he concluded at the end of the article, obviously, the tests that are taken by podiatrists don't mean anything. Isn't that interesting? But where's our friend neutral? It's about one-third, two-thirds. You remember the one-third, two-third rule? It's about a third pronated. But let's look at the, the graph that came from Dr. Wright uh, that Root published in his book. What's interesting to note is that there's only two degrees of supination and four degrees of pronation in the closed chain. There's a total, a total rotation about the axis in gait of six degrees. This is how much motion it actually occurs around the sub joint axis. Not very much. It's not very much motion at all, not enough to even describe the amount of pronation that we visualize when somebody walks. The trouble is, if you made an orthotic in that position, by the time the foot collapsed enough to hit the orthotic, you've already sacrificed your four goals. This this orthotic is not going to prepare the foot to hit the ground and cause it to hit the ground in greater supination. It's certainly not going to change the posture of the foot, resupinate the foot by mid-stance. 
It's not going to transfer weight onto the first metatarsal, nor is it going to eliminate functional hallux limitus. And we did a study, it was published in RCT in, uh, at Georgia State University, where they actually measured the difference in distribution of forces at propulsion using these orthotics compared to the mass position orthoses and found that this orthotic transfers 44% less force onto the first metatarsal. And in fact, earlier studies showed that this orthotic actually diverts force away from the first metatarsal onto the lesser metatarsals. Does exactly the opposite. So we have an orthotic that sacrifices the goals that we're talking about. So what I'm going to offer you is a fresh way of looking at biomechanics. And the first thing I'm going to state that if, if I was to choose what is the most important axis of pronation and supination of the foot, it would not be the subtalar joint axis. The subtalar joint axis only rotates about six degrees. What would be the most important axis? It would be the heel rocker axis. I thought it was really uh, quite an original thought until I noticed it's right in the, the theorems. In theorem one, it talks about during the contact period of stance, the heel strikes the ground in a forward rolling direction. It's stated. But if you go back in the literature, you'll find that Jacqueline Perry first came out with the idea 30 years ago in her book, Gate Analysis, and she called it the heel rocker mechanism. Not an axis, a mechanism. Why? Very hard to pin down the axis. What Jacqueline Perry's brilliant observation was, and I mean this is brilliant, not sarcastically, is that the heel is round. What an ingenious design. A round heel, when it hits the ground, will answer with an appropriate axis regardless of what angle it comes at the ground, even backwards. So a round heel will facilitate an infinite number of axes. But for forward gait, we could define that axis as slightly forward on the lateral side to posterior medial so that the calcaneus rolls sagittally primarily, but slightly toward the medial side during from heel strike to full pronation. And this motion describes pronation of the foot much better than this motion. So that would be the heel rocker axis and that axis would be the most important axis. This one right here. That axis defines the forward roll, the collapse of the midfoot, and how the foot actually goes through pronation. Let's look at that. If we add the subtalar joint axis to this picture, you'll notice that the subtalar joint axis is along for the ride. The subtalar axis translates tremendously but only rotates six degrees. It has a huge translation forward. That I would propose to you, Jacqueline Perry's heel rocker axis is what I'd propose to you as the most important axis of pronation and supination of the foot. So therefore, what is the function of the subtalar joint axis? Why do we have a subtalar joint axis? Let's take a look. Remember what I told you earlier. When the anterior facet is level, I took a little coffee stirrer and glued it onto the anterior facet, the calcaneus is inverted. With that knowledge, I want you to look at how the talus and calcaneus move around each other from heel strike to full pronation. What you'll notice is very little rotation occurring between the bones here but the rotation begins about here. In fact, this was just recently confirmed by Van Langlen with live uh, 